but think of how he came so far from glory came and dwelt among the lowly such as I to suffer shame and such disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place and I ask myself this question who am I who am I that a would bleed and die for Who am I that he would pray not my will thine for the answer I may never know why he When I'm reminded of his words, I'll leave you never. If be true, I'll give to you life forever. I wonder what I could have done to deserve God's only son to fight my battles until they're won for who am I who am I that I would bleed and die for who am I that he would pray I will die for the answer I may never know why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go to an old rugged cross he'd go that to an old rugged cross he'd go for him all That was beautiful. I'm cer certain that that expresses the testimony of each of us. None of us feel worthy of the price the Son of God paid that we might be redeemed. Boy, well, I'm glad he paid that price, aren't you? What a joy to be delivered from Satan's bondage, to be awakened from spiritual death to newness of life to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to live a life
that is free from sin, a life of holiness, a life of purity. And only through Jesus was that made possible. Today I'm going to close a mini-series. I didn't announce it as a mini-series for that purpose that I wanted everybody to keep coming. (laughs) But the month of February for me has been a time of prayer and beseeching the Lord for revival to come not only to this church, but to our communities, to our nation, and to the world. And we're going to continue to keep this on the burner through our election time. We're going to ask God to help us as a nation to be revived again. But next month, I'm going to be encouraging you to come to church faithfully. I told my men in our prayer group, at least my theme, I've got sermon ideas for it. They're not all together yet. But I'm going to be preaching on marching to church in March. And I want you to come out. We're going to talk about, Ninian said the other day to me, Brother Abshire, I wish you'd preach a sermon on faith. Well, I've thought about kicking it off with marching to church for faith. Marching to church for fellowship. Marching to church for the fundamentals of God's Word. These are some of the thoughts I'm having. Don't hold me to it. I don't know what the Lord's going to do with it. But I do want you to march to church in March. (laughs) I want you to be here. And I want us to really gain momentum and steam as we prepare for Easter Sunday. How many knows when Easter Sunday is this year? April the 8th. That's right. April the 8th. And we want to have a great group of people. Last year we had over 200 people here. Wasn't that awesome? Tremendous. And we're going to do better than that this year because we're going to march to church in March and we're going to invite others to come with us. It's just going to be natural for this place to be packed out for Easter Sunday. Turn with me this morning to Isaiah 64. The pastor and I at Decatur prayed together about the Sunday morning and Sunday evening service there. He said, Brother Absher, why can't we move people to an altar of prayer? And I said, sir, I don't know. I said, we, he said, do you have altar service? I said, yes, we have altar services. Do people come? Yes, people come. But not in the measure I'd like to see us come. And we talked about the importance of God's people being at an altar of prayer in public worship, crying out to God, beseeching Him in His throne. We all pray privately, but corporately we need to pray together. In this particular chapter of Isaiah, the prophet is praying for God to come down in their midst. Would you like to see that happen this morning? How many would like to see God come down in our midst? What a powerful, powerful thing that would be. I was talking to a man at Effingham Church where we pastored before we came here. And he was saying, Brother Absher, we had the best service we've had since you and Sister Absher left here last Sunday. He said, the pastor never got to preach said young people began to stand up and share testimonies and said it led to adults begin to cry and weep and said before you know it, two-thirds of the church was at the front praying and beseeching God for our church. I said, praise the Lord. That's wonderful, isn't it? Isaiah 64, what a powerful, powerful prayer. He says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at your presence. And when the melting fire burneth, 
the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we looked not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for that person that waiteth for him. Thou meetest him that rejoices. And worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. Behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned, and those is continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Verse 1 simply says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. What a burden was on prophet Isaiah for the people of God. He wanted the holy presence of Almighty God to come in such a way that even the mountains, mountains would melt would flow like a river. There are many mountains here this morning in our own personal lives and in the life of this church that we could pray that God would melt and that they would flow like a river. There are many problems we'd like to see solved. There are many needs we'd like to see met. There are many sins perhaps that need to be forgiven. There are many relationships that need healing. There are many things in our life individually and collectively as a church that we want to see accomplished. And certainly in the state of Alabama, this prayer I pray for our state regularly. God, please come down and do the only thing that you can do. We cannot do it in our human flesh and frailty, but God can do it. How many of you believe that? God can do it. He can bring revival. If we depend upon Him. Let us pray to Him this morning. Loving Father, our hearts are so burdened for the state of Alabama, the Church of God Reformation Movement, for our local church here at Rock Creek and other local churches throughout the area. Father, we sense that we need a moving of the Spirit of God. Lord, we need the fire from heaven to fall upon us. Father, there's some things that need to be melted away. There's some things, oh God, that need to be purified. There are things, oh God, that we need to take place in our lives that only the movement of God can accomplish this morning. So God, come down in our midst. We who may be unworthy, we, O oh God, who may not deserve such a visitation of your presence, we beseech your throne this morning. God, come down and do your work among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The impatient prophet in our text cried out to God that he would rend the heavens and that he would come down among his people. Have you ever felt this way in your life? God, I need you desperately. God, please manifest yourself. God, please come on the scene. I have felt recently desperate for God's presence. When I consider the national dilemma that we're faced with, when I consider the world situation and all the terrorist implications, when I consider the immorality that abounds not only here, but around the world. 
when I consider churches and how dried up churches have become spiritually and how unconcerned and complacent and indifferent for touching the lives of the lost and those who stand in need of deliverance. So many times we have not the power in our lives to live above sin. So many times we have not the power in our lives to live holy lives and to be pure in heart. I felt like David crying out, Oh God, please come down among us. Do you realize that for God to come down in our midst today, we, we must ask ourselves some straight questions about our desire for Him to come. First of all, before you pray this prayer in your heart, we need to consider you and myself. Do we really want Him to come? Oh, I know we think we do. For then we feel that everything will be made right. We feel that we want God as our provider. We want Him for the physical needs in our life. We want Him for the material needs that we face. We want Him for the spiritual problems we encounter from time to time. We want God for forgiveness when we failed Him. Yes, we want God as our protector from the diseases of our age. We want Him to protect us from the sins that are about us and our enemies to the things of Christ and the judgment that is forthcoming to our nation. However, we forget that when God comes to make things right, He will make right some wrong things in us. When God comes to make things right, He's going to make right some wrong things in us. You say, what do you mean, Brother Absher? Turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. And let's read together what is stated in verse 5 through 9. Paul says to the church at Colossae, after reminding them that we have been risen with Christ, he says in verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which you also walked some time when you lived in them, but now also put off all these, anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. You see, when Jesus comes, when revival takes place in the church, and he's writing to Christians here at the church at Colossae, he says, when God comes, we have to put to death fornication. That's all sexual activity outside the bonds of marriage between one man and one woman till death do they part. He says, we have to put off uncleanness. That's anything that's immorally impure. Inordinate affection, that's unnatural affection. It's referring to homosexuality and lesbianism. But instead of putting it off in our nation today, we're putting it on. And we wonder why that God cannot bless us as a nation. He says evil concupiscence, this is e evil sexual desires. It's what Jesus calls lust in the New Testament. It's looking at others and desiring them. Oh, you may never proposition them, but in your heart there's that evil disposition, that evil sexual desire. God says we've got to put aside these thought processes for revival to come to our nation. And then he says, put off anger. 
He says anger has to be dealt with in the life of the believer for revival to come. We can't be at odds with each other. We have to be forgiving toward one another. We have to live in the spirit of unity. I told this to my council the other day in Alabama. I said, folks, if we can't get along together as a family of God, we can't expect to win this state for Jesus Christ. It's impossible. We have to put off anger. We also have to put off wrath. That's trying to strike out and do something to the person we're angry at. We have to deal with that spirit in our life. Malice is holding that spirit within us. A grudge and resentment and bitterness towards someone else. And we fan that flame over and over till we get to the point we can't stand the other individual. We don't want to be around them. He mentions blasphemy. There are more people blaspheming God today because they come to the house of God to worship Him and then they live the way they want to live throughout the week. They live no different than the world lives. They go to the same places, do the same things. Their lives are never on assignment for Jesus Christ. Jesus said when He came to the church in His day that they were like whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. He said, you're a generation of vipers. He said, you block the doors to the kingdom of God. People who would come in can't come in because of your hypocrisy before them. And then he says, filthy communication out of your mouth. I was told by a member of this church how he picked up a family to take them someplace. And he said, Brother Absher, you wouldn't believe how the little girl talked to her mother. The language she used, the cursing she did. You know, filthy communication has to be cleaned up from our mouths. If we're going to be a witness for Jesus Christ, our tongues have to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. I heard Brother Paul Ramsey went to be with the Lord days after Mama Haw in January. He preached one time, it's not enough not to curse, we shouldn't use slain words. He said if you study slain, it, they are derivatives of real cursing. <laughs> in other words, it's sanctified cursing, if you will. <laughs> And he preached to our young people in the state of Illinois and he said, kids, listen, let your conversation be yay, nay. Don't use by words and don't use curse words. Clean up your conversation and you'll have a greater influence with those who do not know Jesus Christ. And the final thing he says is lie not one to another. He's saying we're to be men and women and young people of integrity. When we tell someone we're going to do it, we do it. When we give our word about something, we keep our word. We're men and women of integrity. If we buy something, we pay for it. Amen? If we in, enter into contractual agreement, we honor the contract. Christians should be the best citizens on the face of this earth because of the teaching of God's holy word. My friends, when God comes among us, we will see ourselves as we really are. Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah starts out, with confrontation with God in his personal life. And I want you to notice what he says in Isaiah chapter 6. He says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, two he covered his feet, two he did fly. 
And one cried unto another, saying, Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now notice what Isaiah said. Then said I, Woe is me, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. My eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was burdened for his nation because he had a confrontation with God that changed his life. He realized he needed refinement. He realized. He was living very little different from the world and his contemporaries. He said, God, purge me. Cleanse me, O God. And God did. And what a prophet he became. He repeats that in our passage of Scripture. Look at verse 6. In Isaiah 64, he says, We are as an unclean thing. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Another prophet said, God, you're through with our ceremonies, our fastings, and our prayers. And I'm paraphrasing. He says, you want our daily lives to be marked by obedience. If we could only understand that when God comes among us, He introduces a new and conquering power. Verse 3 says, when thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. My friends, the mountains in our lives can be moved by the power of God today. The mountain of sin, the mountain of indifference, the mountain of disease, the mountain of selfish living. There's nothing too hard for God Almighty to do when He comes into our midst if we will submit and surrender to Him. But the tragedy is we often cry for the power of God to send upon us, but we, we don't mean completely. We cry for the salvation of God. But we're a little concerned about His sanctification. We want to come to church together to celebrate and feel good, but we don't want to consecrate. We want God's love, but we don't want His judgment. We've been deceived by Satan's permissiveness in our worship so that You're okay and I'm okay. Let's just celebrate together. We've confused conviction with condemnation. I told this at the camp meeting. I had a lady in my church, not here, who said to me, I'm going to quit coming and hear you preach. Or I'm going to leave before you start. I said, why? She said, I feel condemned. I said, no, you don't. Yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. She said, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. She said, what do you mean I don't? I said, only Jesus can condemn. And he will do that in the final judgment. I said, what you're feeling is conviction. If we feel guilty, if we feel uneasy, if we feel on edge... God is trying to move us to move up and do what He's asking us to do. So many pray today like the little boy. (laughs) God, make me good, but not too good. Just good enough to keep from getting a whipping. (laughs) That's the prayer of most Christian, God make me good, but not too good, Lord. Don't overdo it. Don't want to get radical about it. Just good enough to keep from getting in trouble. Just good enough to get to heaven. My friends, we're usually quite content 
for God to keep His safe distance from us. We've tucked Him away in a place we call heaven. We sing about heaven. We're content to sing our praises to Him on Sunday morning while so many times the rest of the week we live without giving thought to Him or what He would have us do. Now secondly, for God to come down in our midst today, we must ask ourselves, have we forgotten that He did come to this earth? (laughs) Over 2,000 years ago, God was in Christ reconciling this world to Himself. He became a man and He had to be truly a man to face temptations we do and yet not sin. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He had to become God because only God, only God could pay the price of redemption. He lived 33 years without one sin, not even guile found in his mouth. He was crucified not for anything he'd done, but for everything we've done and the generations before and after He was raised for our justification. He ascended to God the Father to make intercession for the saints. He waits to receive His bride, the church, unto Himself. But while here, please notice that God showed us exactly how He wanted us to live. As Paul Harvey says, The things that we are put to death are only part of the story. Notice what Paul says to the Colossian people in verse 10 and following. He says, after you've put off the old man, you've put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, vows of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you're called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Jesus demonstrated the life that it's going to take To make heaven our home. Amen. He says we've got to be merciful. What is mercy? It's giving us the good things we don't deserve. So we're merciful to people regardless how they treat us. We're kind. (laughs) We treat people kindly. Not tactlessly but kindly, with humbleness of mind, not considering ourselves better than anyone, not judging anyone, not criticizing anyone. God is our judge. Read Philippians 2. He says, forbearing one another. You may have to bear some things from time to time in your relationship with people, but think of what God has done for you. Forgiving one another. Don't hold grudges. If any man have a quarrel against any, as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Jesus gave us parable after parable. And he said after he had forgiven, after he had done this and been merciful to this, the people would thank God for it and then go treat other people differently. He said, above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of 
perfectness. You know, if you and I have the love of God shed abroad on our hearts, we love everybody. Amen. We love everybody. We pray for everybody. We don't find fault and criticize anybody. Do we have a standard? Of course we do. And we hold ourselves accountable to that standard. But as we move in society, we love everybody. He said, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Be in right relationship with God, right relationship with others. Let there be nothing out of sorts between you and someone else. And then he says, live with a thankful heart. <laughs> Let the world know that we've got something to praise Jesus for. Doesn't hurt you to smile. Some people are wearing themselves out because they frown all the time. Amen? Amen? It takes a lot more muscle to frown than it does to smile. <laughs> Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Teach each other. Admonish each other. Admonish each other. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, do everything in the name of Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Now finally, for God to come down in our midst today, we must ask ourselves, have we forgotten that He wants to continue to come down again and again and again and again and again? I don't want him to come just this morning. <laughs> I want him to come every time we come together. Did not Jesus promise us in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So why isn't he coming down? That's his promise. Well, look back. To our scripture reading found in Isaiah 64. Look back there with me just for a moment. Why isn't he coming? Why isn't he moving in power in U.S. of A.? Why isn't he? Well, look at the second portion of verse 5. Behold, Thou art wroth, for we have sinned. And then he adds this, in those sins is continuance. He said, we've not only sinned, but we're continuing in them. And then he adds, and we shall be saved. He said, do you think for a moment that God is going to save us at the end time if we're living in sin and continuing in it? Look at verse 7. He says, there is none that calleth upon thy name. And then he adds that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquity. Do we not see that our nation is being consumed? Do we not have the spiritual understanding that things are falling down about us? Do we not see that unless God's people who are called by their name humble themselves and pray and cry unto God and rend themselves hopeless without Him, that judgment is pending. Life as usual is not going to continue. Do we not see that? 
My friends, the church today has not experienced what God intends for us to experience. Verse 4 says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither has seen, hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what you hast prepared for him that waiteth for him. He says, if we will begin to wait on the Lord, pray before the Lord, humble ourselves before the Lord, turn from our wicked ways, seek his face, repent of all sin, do what he's asking us to do. He said, God has something wonderful for that people. Can we do it? Yes, we can. The first part of verse 5 says, Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness, those that remember thee in thy ways. He said, If we can tarry before God until we begin to rejoice in him, if we can tarry before God until we begin to work the works of righteousness, if we can tarry before God, that we will walk in His ways. He says God then can turn things around for us, but not until. My friends, for God to come down in our midst this morning, verse 8 has to become real in your life and mine. Notice what He says. But now, O Lord, Thou art our Father. We are the clay. Thou our potter. We all are the work of Thy hand. He said, when we're willing to just get on the potter's wheel as a lump of clay and say, God, you make of me what you want to be, want me to be. I'm not going to bargain with you. I'm not going to withhold your hand. Nothing you ask me to do am I not going to do. I'm willing, Lord, to be the person from this day forward you want me to be. Let's stand together as we look to him in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious word. Lord, it's not always comforting to read it. Sometimes, Lord, there's conviction. Sometimes, God, there's chastening. Sometimes, Lord, there are uncomfortable feelings. But we thank you for loving us enough to teach us the things that must be done for real revival to come to us individually and to our families and to our local church, to the churches throughout the state and nation and world. Oh God, revive us again we pray. In Christ's name, amen.